that's loud enough. I should probably back up a little bit. My voice will carry. Uh, welcome to this evening's meeting, Monday, May 23rd, 2022, the Education Operations Committee meeting. Agenda item number two, I'd like to uh, seek a motion to approve the minutes of the April 25th, 2022 Education Operations Committee meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Agenda number three, before we start with the public student <coughs> comment, I'm going to uh, pass it off to Dr. Hills for a second here. Dr. Hills has something to say before we open up to the community. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Boucher. Um, yeah, clearly we've we've got uh, a topic of interest and some controversy, and I'd like to start by offering an apology. When we were reviewing the Human Growth and Development Policy, um, we could see that there was going to be minimal, if any, change to the actual curriculum that the students experience. And so we did not forecast um, this kind of conflict or confusion or fear. And so, so I want to apologize for not communicating about this more proactively. Uh, again, like I said, we didn't forecast this kind of uh, reaction. So for those of you who are here and for those of you who are listening, um, if you are interested uh, in that human growth and development topic. Um, I just want to reiterate the messages we've been putting out, which is um, we are removing nothing from the human growth and development curriculum. Uh, there is one required addition um, about the safe haven for newborns. Um, that is the only addition. The language, if you saw the draft policies, the language that was struck out, much of that was rewritten, and the only purpose for the striking and adding the rearranging of language was to ensure that our school board policies um, are lockstep with state statute. Uh, we work with a, a company called Neola who employs a team of attorneys to review state and federal laws uh, and they give us recommendations and sometimes the changes are what are called technical changes and frankly much of what was in that policy was considered a technical change and doesn't even require board approval. So, um, but that's the reason that the language was rearranged. So again, I apologize for, for not communicating that ahead of time, but I just want everybody to know that we are not changing the human growth, and we're not removing anything from the human growth and development curriculum. So I hope that um, puts some people's minds at ease, uh, and certainly if you, will, if you have more comments, we're happy to hear them. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so as directed, if I may do a little summary, everything that was in that policy is still in that policy with the addition of what Neola suggested due to Act 90. Correct. And you know, if the board wanted to reinstate that language, that would certainly be an option. But it, it, uh, it literally won't make a difference in the curriculum. We still follow the board approved human growth and development curriculum that was approved two years ago as recommended by the, the uh, advisory committee. Okay. Thank you for that, Dr. Hiltz. And with that, I'm going to move into public and student comment. Uh, let me start with uh, the board recognizes the value of the public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on district matters. Please identify yourself by name and state your address when you come up to speak. Each statement made by a participant shall be limited to three minutes in duration. Ms. Peck will identify time remaining. Ms. Peck is over to our right, your left. Speakers shall direct all comments to the board and not to the staff or other participants. Public comments may not identify specific personnel or students by name or through the use of a sufficiently detailed description. So as to identify the individual staff or student. Presiding officer values civil discourse and may interrupt, terminate, or prohibit comments that do not adhere to those rules. So with that reminder, let us open up with Mary Hoffman. Where is it? Right here? Right up here, please. Well, I heard about today's <coughs> meeting because of social media this morning. And with respect to what you have just said about things not changing, 
with the political environment and things being as polarized as they are, there was backpedaling, and I just, I can't trust. I'm sorry, but I cannot trust. We need to, I was terrified and frightened and scared. That's all the same thing, actually. But yes, <laughs> when I read that this morning, and I was angry. We need to have a trusted, reliable source of education for these items for our children. They can go out and learn them on the street, but that's not always reliable. Until recently, I was the mother of a Wausau School District child. Finding time to inform myself about politics, civil issues, raising a son, working full time, and running a household did not leave me a lot of time to inform myself about things that I wanted to know about. And I believe that's what's going on with the majority of people in this town, if not in the world. Polarization in our politics has moved into health care and into our classrooms, and it should not be there. We are the land of the free, but land of the free. Um, we are setting the clock back decades, if not centuries, in leadership, civil rights, and teaching with the things that are going on in our schools, not just here. I'm citing Florida, Georgia, Texas. We need to teach our children as much as we can, and that includes about their own bodies. We need to open the door to the world beyond our own doors and teach them wisdom and provide them with patience, respect of other cultures, and help them to advance and nurture. We should be working to provide an open and informed school system to teach our children and prepare them for much more that in, in their life to come. Let's get back to modern day advances in civil rights, teaching, learning, and understanding and acceptance. We cannot be world leaders or teach world leaders if we are falling backwards. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Megan Merrill. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes. Perfect. Hi, my name is Megan Morrill. I reside at 1025 Everest Boulevard in Wausau, Wisconsin. And for a couple more days, I'm currently a student of the Wausau School District. I understand changes will not be made tonight, but I'm afraid of what these decision, discussions may lead to. I worry that the steps taken today are opening the doors to changes that don't benefit the student body or anyone for that matter. I hope that I'm wrong, but if I'm not, I would like my voice to be heard and on record as something to deeply consider as you consider this topic in the future. Wausau School Board members, I want to speak today regarding your discussions to teach abstinence only in Wausau schools. A categorical failure of an education policy, both quantitatively and qualitatively. A failure so egregious that 95% of Americans don't practice abstinence. Which means it's more than likely that no one on this board subscribes to the very policy you're considering. But I digress. I'm actually absolutely sure none of you actually subscribe to the abstinence personally. I'm left wondering what merit you find instituting such an unintelligent policy. After reading and researching abstinence only, versus comprehensive sexual education, there are only a few reasons that logically make sense to support abstinence only. First, there are financial benefits. There's more federal funding available for school systems that prescribe to abstinence only. But I'm a student, not some client base or a product you leverage for financial gains. Second, it's a political agenda. It's well known since the early 90s, abstinence only is approved teachings of the Christian right. But you're elected nonpartisan officials. So the idea that any of you would use your position to leverage a favor with Jack Hogendyke or any other political zealot is abhorrent, immoral, and unethical. Finally, it's imposing your own morality onto the community. But I'm a student. 
your school board members, and it's your job to facilitate my education by supporting the students and teachers of WASA, not just the administrators and boosters. If you're interested in saving my soul or parenting me, I'd suggest starting a church or adopting a puppy. Do your jobs as school board members and give us the education policy that has proven to reduce teen pregnancies, STDs, and it actually educates me as a student. Leave your financial, politics, and personal ethics at home, just like I'm asked to do every day I walk into school. I'm there to learn, not stick my head in the sand. Thank you. Next on the <coughs> list, Micah Jenkins. Hughes Avenue in Western Wisconsin. My name is Mika Jenkins. And as a young queer student, going to, when, when I went to West West, I was taught the basics of safe, safe sex. Safe sex goes beyond just where kind of when you're going to have sex. Safe sex also goes into who you're going to have sex with. Absence only will actually make that worse because people are going to have rape and other sexual harassment charges. We cannot allow that to happen in our school systems. And it makes me cringe that a young queer person could not be sexually assaulted for no reason at all, just because they are different. We need to at least address that that is an issue. And that if a queer person is going to be assaulted, it's on all of your hands. Not mine. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. Here we go. Next on the list, Christine Song. Good evening. Um, I was a member of the 2019 Human Growth and Development Committee um, for the Wasa School District, and I'm proud of the work the committee did and has done to ensure students receive comprehensive sex education that provides them with the tools and resources um, to keep them safe and healthy and to provide information to help them understand and make informed choices surrounding their health, sexuality, and development. Mm -hmm. The work of the committee was not always smooth sailing. As with any diverse group of people, opinions differed on what content should be included in the curriculum. But in the end, I believe the curriculum approved by the board was exceptional. It is for that reason that I felt compelled to speak tonight regarding the proposed changes to the Human Growth and Development Handbook Policy. I'm well aware of where the changes are being made and where they're not being made. Um, but that was submitted, though, tonight on the agenda uh, for tonight's meeting. Here's why I'm concerned. In 2012, the Wisconsin State Republican Legislature passed an ultra-conservative revision to Statute 2011, Wisconsin Act 216, to no longer mandate instruction on human growth and development. In other words, instruction on gender identity, sexual orientation, healthy relationships, puberty, and personal safety were removed from the statute and no longer required. Many districts chose, however, to keep and update this important health information as part of their curriculum to ensure students have the tools and resources, as I said, they need to navigate these areas. Wausau was one of those districts, and in conjunction with material supported and provided by the DPI, continues to provide this essential comprehensive education for students in the district. The revisions to the policies as submitted for approval on the agenda tonight essentially remove the essential human growth and development content added by the committee. When parents and residents questioned the board regarding these changes, a canned response with little to no explanation was provided. If the curriculum were to reflect the changes proposed in the policy handbook revisions, essentially human growth and development would cease to exist and sex education would then become abstinence only instruction. I strongly believe the Act 90 mandate language that the board is referencing per NAOLA, right, to change the policy um, with, it, um, can be added to the policy handbook without requiring re the revision submitted to Statute 2011, Wisconsin Act 216. You can submit something for Act 90 without changing uh, 216. I'm, I'm confident of that. 
I worry in addition with the addition of the new board members and with some of the current board members who have publicly expressed conservative views regarding sex education in schools, that action may be taken by the board to remove the current human growth and development curriculum and create a program consistent with the language and content solely as written in Statute Act 216, aka abstinence only. The handbook policy revision submitted for approval certainly opened the door for that. And as Administrator Hill stated today, policy changes can impact curriculum. I also believe that Act 90 mandate language, I said that already. Um, the bottom line is, with the current board makeup, they have the votes to do just that. The science has not changed. The data tells us abstinence-only education increases teen pregnancy and STD transmission rates and hurts kids. The response today should send a clear message to the WESA School Board that the people who reside here in the school district want comprehensive sex education. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next person on the list, Andrew Lynch. Hello, uh, Andrew Lynch, 1014 Graves, <clears throat> Graves Avenue in Wallace Hall. And uh, obviously this issue is uh, on uh, human growth and development has created a lot of concern. And uh, although I, I do appreciate uh, Dr. Hiltz's uh, video, email, and your, your uh, message here today, I think that's probably <clears throat> a better example of how we as parents feel uninformed on this change. I think uh, you know something as important as this topic really deserves to uh, be understood uh, by residents of the district and parents of children in school. So I don't think it would be <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think it would be uh, inappropriate to pull that item from the agenda, in order to give the school district more time to explain what they uh, what the purpose of that is, and you know. Uh, where it can lead, whether it does mean actually changing curriculum or it doesn't. I think that would be a, a really good opportunity for the school district to reach out to parents, explain that, <coughs> excuse me, explain the situation, and, you know, perhaps take it up another meeting when we have time to have considered the options and feel informed. So I please uh, ask for that consideration tonight. Thank you. on the list, Avia Lynch. Hello, it's Avia Lynch. I am on 1014 Graves Avenue in Wausau, Wisconsin. And I am a young student through the Wausau School District. I'm a freshman. I'm young, yes. So, my main question tonight is, what's the involvement with the student body? It's our education practically on the line here. It's, I, I survived a pandemic. I've gone through, ultimately, I've gone through so much in my life, yet this is, all this misinformation that I've been hearing is one of the scariest things that I've had, that I've heard recently. It shouldn't be my job to have to learn about safe sex. That is my health teacher's job. Those, we are students. We are supposed to be spending our time learning and focusing on our main educations, not focusing on, am I going to be able to figure out what to do today because I don't know what safe sex is. Personally, I do, but there are students out there that don't know. There are students that are, do not have access to anything. Teachers have the ability to help, yet if this is passed, it all goes down the drain. It all disappears. That's all. Thank you. Next on the list, Mr. Grau, Bruce Grau. 
I'm Bruce Crowell, 1115 North 10th Street. And uh, as a parent, I want the best for my kids. I want them to be happy, confident in themselves, and knowledgeable about the complex ways of the world. My wife and I try very hard and try our best, but we realize we need help. We count on public education to work with us on this. I want to thank the public schools that, among other things, provided them a comprehensive and compassionate sex education. Because of that, my kids are comfortable with their human sexuality. But since the passage of state legislation in 2012, this best approach to sex has been diminished due to a religious-based offensive which has proven ineffective in preventing un unwanted pregnancies or delaying the initiation of sexual activity. In fact, in abstinence-only districts, the number of pregnancies have increased. Just say no is a failure. The DPI shows a lot of leeway for, for each district to determine their approach to sex ed, but cautions that the lessons of an abstinence-centered approach use fear to motivate students to abstain from sexual activity. I don't want my kids to be afraid to talk about sex. It appears the board may be marching us towards adopting an unbalanced, failed, and harmful strategy condemned by expert public health, human rights, and many faith leader advocates. This movement needs to be watched and measured closely. The board must, one, measure adolescent birth rate, initiation of sexual activity, and contraction of STIs. Two, survey psychosocial questions to parents and high school students related to factors associated to a healthy sexual behavior. And three, take baseline measurements now than every two years and post it publicly. In our democracy, there are appropriate places for just say no approaches to sex. There's Sunday school, there's private school, but public school needs to remain unbiased and secular. Helping parents develop confident and knowing children comfortable in dealing with the challenges of our complex, increasingly complex society, and this includes sex. <coughs> Commit to us tonight that this current discussion will not lead to an abstinence-only policy now or ever. Theocracy and democracy don't mix. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Next on the list, Sarah Worth. Good evening. My name is Sarah Worth. I reside at 512 Ruder Street in Wausau. I am the parent of a 16 and 14 year old student in the district. Tonight's agenda contains suggested changes to the growth and human development policy. And while there are many changes, the only one I'm here to address is the removal of the only language in the policy regarding education about the use of contraceptives and barrier methods to prevent pregnancies and STDs. There were many changes, but that's the one piece that was actually removed. By removing this section, the only instruction that would remain is that of abstinence. Inquiries regarding this change have been met with the response that the changes do not impact current curriculum, they are meant to keep the district policies consistent with current statutory requirements, and that we are not proposing any curriculum changes at this time. If there's no plan to change a the curriculum, then why change the policy? Why can't our policy go above and beyond the state requirements? If we plan to teach it, wouldn't it in fact be disingenuous to remove it from the policy? I submit that if you remove it from the policy today, the groundwork is being laid to remove it from the curriculum in the future. Further, the proposed policy currently states that the district is to provide medically accurate information about HPV, HIV, and AIDS. Is it medically accurate to have a policy that only teaches abstinence to the exclusion of instruction on other barrier methods? 
The proposed policy also states methods and materials should not discriminate against a student on the basis of several things, including religion and against sexually active students. While some religious beliefs promote abstinence, not everyone shares in those beliefs. Isn't limiting our education to abstinence only actually discriminatory against those students? Can't the same be said in regard to students who are already sexually active? Fact, there is a percentage of students who will never pick up a book or write an essay upon graduation, yet they are required to learn about it while in our schools. Fact, about 80% of Americans will have a credit card, yet 100% of our students are required to take a financial literacy course. Fact, 82% of unmarried men and 99% of sexually experienced women in the U.S. ages 15 to 44 have used at least one contraceptive method, 82 to 99%, yet we are going to adopt a policy that makes no mention of these methods? I propose that an abstinence-only policy is more dangerous to the future of our children than providing factual medical information regarding this life-changing topic. You may be a part of the 1 to 18% who do not use contraceptives, and that's fine. But we need to think about all of our students coming from a variety of backgrounds, beliefs, and families. Think about this. We have students who reply on our schools for the only meal they get in a day. What percentage of our student population will get reliable, accurate, comprehensive information about preventing pregnancy and STDs if it's not provided at school? I will end by restating, if you're not planning to change the curriculum, then why change the policy? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Three more, and usually we get the ten in three minutes, thirty minutes. Does the board have a problem with hearing everybody? Okay, we will continue. Uh, Mr. Johnson, Jeff Johnson. And board, thank you for the opportunity. A lot of great information has been imparted from this desk and this microphone. I'm going to ask you to put it in a larger context. Start from the beginning. Why do we have public schools? Maybe it's because I'm a philosophy major, but you've got to go back to the basics. Why do we exist? We exist, are we there for the parents because they need their kids educated and they need to go to work and they need somebody to watch them? Or is it a greater? need, the need of society as a whole, and that is what is kind of missing here. Um, if we look at public education as a societal need, not a parental need, not a community, it's, it's all of society. That is your true constituency. So I want you to keep that in mind when you look at making changes in policy as serious as this um, with regard to human growth and development. Absence only would be, if you look at it historically, in the history of humankind, young people have always had sex. If you don't believe me, look at the marriage dates of your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and look when their first child was born. It's nothing new. It is nothing new. It is a reality that we, in the world in which we live, it is going to happen. How are we going to deal with it? Now, society as a whole needs us to be dealt with in a rational and scientific method. Not based on anyone's personal agenda, anyone's um, religious approach, anyone's personal feelings. Society as a whole must be served. And I submit that it was much better served with a comprehensive program. Now to broaden that out a little bit more, and another agenda item was the revision, actually redaction of pretty much the entire ethics section of the handbook. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I expect my elected officials to have a code of ethics that they're going to adhere to. Now, striking out the entire code does not engender trust from the public towards this board. I think it is foolish. I think it's unnecessary. Um, it's in effect saying you are above. You don't need ethics rules. You don't need any rules because you have the votes, you're going to do what you want. Um, and that's not acceptable. 
there have been other changes which have raised questions. And these are things that nobody ever ran on. Nobody mentioned when they campaigned. Nobody said, when we get in, we're going to remove books from the curriculum. When we get in, we're going to rewrite human growth and development and teach apps and, and push abstinence only. And we're going to wipe out the ethics section of the handbook. Nobody said that. So there's a matter of trust. And, and I'm here to say, there's not a lot of it out there at this point in time. So I want you to take a big picture view. Step back, reassess where you are, and reassess what the district needs going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Next on the list, Carrie Moreau. My name is Carrie Morrall. I live at 1025 Everest Boulevard. Um, I just wanted you guys to all note there's been so many speakers tonight, not one person has been behind what is proposed as changes to the handbook. There's a lot of people that feel very emotional the other way, and I think you guys need to pay attention to that. I haven't I tried to keep notes. Did it? Was anybody for this? Um, I feel like a lot of the talk has been really disingenuous. It's kind of like, we're going to make these changes, but don't look over here. Look over there. Um, because it's not really a change, but we need to do it. Um, I just, I think, from what the last person said, um, there's a lot of problems with trust with the school district. And this is one way you can fix it. You do what you say you're going to do. Um, I think some of the backtracking, um, it, it's just not working. And I hope that you guys all just pay attention to all the people that have written in and all the people that have gotten up tonight. It's it's very important. Thank you. Next on the list, Julian Brown. Hello, my name is Julian Brown. I'm a student at Horseman Middle School. Uh, I made the decision to attend the meeting tonight because I heard that the board would be discussing possible changes to the policy on human growth and development. I know that the changes do not have directly affect the curriculum, but I do also know that they do open up the possibility of doing so. I agree that abstinence is the best form of birth control, but whether we like it or not, students are having sexual relationships, so what we need is more comprehensive sex, not less. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate the input. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and uh, giving us your input. I and I know the board greatly appreciates the input and understanding what you're feeling. Also, I'd like to uh, thank the people that wrote in. There was a large list of people that wrote in. And I, because I got the list late, I will be reading all of those later on. And I do appreciate the fact that they had uh, given us their points of view as well. So thank you very much for your points of view, and I appreciate that. Uh, moving on to agenda number four, we have a new charter school proposal. And this is to us for the presentation of the community. Um, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Hiltz introduce our people from the community pertaining to this chart. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, well, it's been about six weeks, uh, I think, I had an invitation to meet to discuss a new charter school. And um, I was intrigued. Uh, obviously, we had a lot going on. Um, but I'm very thankful that I accepted the invitation uh, because uh, I sat down and met Dr. Megan Simpkins. Uh, she told me about uh, kind of her vision and, uh, and some experiences she's had uh, along with her, her, uh, her own children. And so um, the, uh, the, the charter school has, the, the idea has merit. So what uh, Megan and Camomile from DPI, the Charter Resource Center, are going to propose to you tonight is a little bit of background information on a possible charter school and what they'll be asking you for is permission to explore the idea. 
that's where we're at in the process. Uh, and at this point, I will turn this over to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Megan Hughes, or maiden name Simkins, it's okay, it's email. <laughs> um, and I appreciate you guys taking the time today to hear us out. Otherwise, I think we can just get started, or this is Chamomile. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Chamomile Nelson. Johnson Resource Center for Charter Schools. So I am here tonight to really answer questions at the Wisconsin Resource Center for Charter Schools, or their abbreviation is WORKS. We're out of CESA 9, um, so you're CESA, and we work all throughout the state of Wisconsin supporting districts as authorizers, um, any other authorizing authorities initiatives and then schools that are charter schools and so I'm not here representing Megan or the district per se I'm here to support the conversation um, because we want to help um, authorizers and charter schools have the best relationship that they possibly can all right so um, I'm hoping I can figure out this quicker okay so um, the what we're, we don't have a formal name for it yet but we'll just call the Wisconsin Community Charter School for the for the yeah for Wassa mm -hmm. um, Wassa Community Charter School uh, essentially it stems from a desire to create sort of an environmentally based learning center for the students of Wassa Wisconsin um, and we're at the very nascent beginning stages of it. We plan to apply for a grant, which is roughly a $700,000 grant. That comes from a $95 million funding that the state of Wisconsin got several years ago for the sole purpose of developing community charter schools. Um, that grant allows us to not only buy materials and such for the school itself, but to also fund a planning year. And the, um, as the slide says, you know, it's like $150,000 dog year for that purpose, where that's building websites, hiring, hiring faculty, all that kind of thing, uh, with the goal of opening the school in the fall of 2024. Um, this would be uh, largely, if any of you are familiar with the Tomorrow River Community Charter School located out near Sunset Lake in, um, in Amherst, Wisconsin, it would be largely modeled off of that. So we'd be looking at outdoor environmental education. The authorizer would be the Wausau School District. That's why I approached Dr. Hiltz to begin with. The location would be the Wausau School Forest. And we would start with pre-K to fourth grade and uh, the initial opening in the fall of 2024 with a goal of adding one class per year up to eighth grade and then kind of reassessing from there because there's some a bunch of different bureaucratic things that come into play this would be a tuition free public charter school um, and then the curriculum would be waldorf inspired outdoor education so um the the waldorf pedagogy kind of looks a lot at, at, at um, allowing the natural like, inspiration and curiosity of children to, to grow through active play and learning. Um, like I spoke of before, we're going to largely utilize or um, kind of borrow, learn from, optimize the existing curriculum at the Tomorrow River Community Charter School, which has been very successful. They've been in practice now for a decade or more. Um, they, yeah, they have a wait list for every class. Um, they, you know, their outcomes are very positive. The school's done very well. Um, this would be so. The other nice thing about that is having curriculum that's been successful and has sort of been tried and has been tested in the realest way will help us to get the grant itself. That will make our grant application more powerful, um, but it also allows us to borrow on a curriculum that we know has worked well and um, and you know the whole our whole goal here is for it to be collaborative um, something that is a conversation between ourselves and the school district and it allows for another option for the students um, in terms of some statistics of the Wal Waldorf pedagogy and the success of that 94 percent of the students attend college or university it was developed in 1919. Um, there's over 2,000 schools across the world using this particular pedagogy. And there's over 60 Waldorf schools within the United States. Um, and so a kind of a brief look at the curriculum is this idea that children are learning kind of through their hands and heart and that 
it looks, I mean, for me as a physician, one of the pieces that I like is that it kind of looks at neurological development of the brain and what the brain is capable of at certain ages and allowing, um, allowing us to embrace that versus potentially work against it or constrain it. Um, so this idea that children aren't neurologically ready to sit still and to, and to uh, be behind technology or something at young ages. Um, and instead they actually flourish and um, when they're nurtured through allowing them to play and learn through play. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of studies on this, which I, you know, we can talk about at a different time, but really the basis of this is that we want to engage in collaborative emotional learning that allows them to touch, hold, feel what they're learning about and engages them in a way that's neurologically appropriate. One of the main things is using nature as a platform for learning. Um, anybody who has children knows that like taking kids outside <laughs> makes life a whole lot better. That's why winter can be hard in Wisconsin on parents. Um, and, it, and we would utilize that uh, nature and the ability to be outside and have it <coughs> outside right out the doors of, of whatever classroom it is. Um, the whole goal of that is to really is to really foster that and use it to our advantage. Um, the other thing that's very unique to Waldorf pedagogy is something called looping, which is essentially that teachers follow their students through multiple years of education. The idea here is that the teacher is able to build trust and to get a really good understanding of the students they're working with and their different you know, strengths and weaknesses, how they learn, and what might work for different students at different times. Um, and at Tomorrow River, for instance, the teachers follow students from kindergarten to eighth grade, correct? So they, so that class as a cohort not only has their cohort, but has a teacher that's with them the entire time, which of course allows, allows for a much more um, meaningful relationship. And then, I already touched on this a little bit, but the developmentally appropriateness of this, of what, how we're teaching and, and <coughs> why we're teaching it. And it just that neurological development is a close consideration. These are just things that we're doing. Um, and then, a multidisciplinary approach to the education itself. You're looking at immersion. Um, so, you, and Cameron, you might be able to talk about this more fluently than myself because I'm, you know, still getting myself up to speed and everything. But uh, basically, the subjects are taught and through like three to six weeks blocks involving deep dive learning that is then kind of consolidated over multiple different formats and forums. So when you start learning about math or reading or anything, you're going to experience that not just by a book, but by doing something outside as well. And then and so what that allows for is, as we all know, people learn differently. Some people are auditory learners, some people are visual learners, some people are spatial, and, and usually there's one that you're really good at, and then there's kind of other things that you're not as good at. Um, and the idea is that every kid has an opportunity to learn in the facet that suits them best. Um, and that also, of course, teaches resilience and empathy and all these other things. Um, and that, I talk about that for a long time. <laughs> okay, um, so next steps would be a community needs assessment. This is uh, also a mandatory step for the grant application. We have to get a sense of like, does the community want this? Is the community curious about this? This would, um, Dr. Hilton and I already talked, it would involve a survey through the district itself or a questionnaire would be sent out to the age appropriate parents of you know students who would fall into our potential pool. And then we'd have town hall meetings, which would involve be more conversational um, and kind of let us uh, get more into the the deep dive and the nitty gritty of what this would look like. And then uh, obviously outreach um, via websites and articles. And these are more resources. Uh, now at this point, is just if you guys have any questions. Well, let's let's ask questions. Um, would you like to start off? Yeah. So I have a quick question. So, you know, you mentioned about winter and how we can't get kids out. What, what are, what are, what's the curriculum look like over those winter months when kids can't get outside? Because it's, you know, 
80 below and the ones <laughs> are below. That's a really good question. Um, so I think the first thing is that with these types of schools, the kind of coined saying is there's no bad weather, there's just bad clothing. So the expectation, and I can say my children currently go to Monk Gardens, which is um, a new preschool, but Pactus is a very similar approach where it's like, you just put them in their snow pants and put them out in the cold. And the truth is, is that they used to, I mean, they protest a little. I mean, I have I have four and a half year old twins, so they, they protest a bit, but um, it's, it, it's um, approached as like, this is just part of what we do, you know? And knowing that, like, obviously there's times and we follow the guidelines of the Wausau School District. So if the Wausau School District closes because it's too cold, then, then so does Sprouts or so would the, the Wausau Community Charter School. Um, but that also, the upside of that is that it builds resilience in kids. It makes, it makes kids tough in a way that's difficult to do because that's such a tacit thing. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with being outside in the cold as long as you're appropriately dressed. But there would be indoor spaces for yes. all the classrooms. So Sorry. The, <laughs> the goal is that the kids would be outside as much as possible, but there's, there's going to be an indoor space. So every, every grade would have its own classroom. That would be part of, like, before we ever opened doors or something. Of course, there would be a classroom for every grade. Thank you. I, I do like the idea. I mean, I've seen my kids grow and do different things. I know some kids just really love being outside, and they've learned a lot more through that. So I think that's a good idea. Thank you. You mentioned uh, Amherst and is it Two Rivers? Tomorrow. Or tomorrow, sorry. Tomorrow. Do you know how many students are like enrolled in that particular Jeez. program? <laughs> yeah, I can speak to that a little. I'm the, I'm the founder of that school. So um, prior to working with the Wisconsin Resource Center for Charter Schools, I was as executive director of that school for nine years. Um, so we opened the doors um, in 2013 to 50 students, and the school is now at 275 students. Um, in grades pre-kindergarten through eighth. They have an on-site program that's at that Central Wisconsin Environmental Station, so very similar setting to what the school boards would be. Um, and what they found is the only public welder school in the state of Wisconsin is that students from across the state were interested in that style of education. So five years ago, they started a virtual program. So that number includes students from around the state that are participating in the virtual program in addition to the on-site program. Um, so definitely, the school has seen great success in that area, waiting lists for their classes, but we've also seen that it's uh, educational pedagogy that people want in other parts of the state. So we've definitely had commuters from Wausau and or people participating in the virtual program from up here. So I think you would have interest um, in this area for that style of education. And that's a single tracked school, so one classroom per grade. And the vision for this school would be similar. I think it goes without saying that you would never be able to support. It goes without saying that you would never be able to support the same size of classroom as you would in a in a school like this. You know, there's going to be less kids per class. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more quick question? Yeah. I'm sorry. So how do you see at the Tomorrow River? How do you see the transition from these kids? You know, spend a lot of time outdoors from eight to obviously freshman year. How has that gone over for them? Um, it's gone over well. I mean, it, is, it, it definitely is a transition. The kids are like, wow, this is really a lot of time in a desk inside. But a big part of the pedagogy is really preparing those kids for life after that school. All the same common core standards are met. The order and how they're met looks a little bit different, but when they walk out the doors, they will have all the same content knowledge. Um, uh, you know, that being said, in our area, we've seen families and students want a continuation for that. So we are starting a high school that's opening this year that is a Waldorf-inspired public high school um, so that the kids and families do have an option to continue that through those high school years. Um, just a couple quick questions. Uh, do you have in mind a space that you would be you, you kind of mentioned it'd be out at school for us for your outdoor. I would imagine then you're thinking classroom space would be in that same location. Yeah. And that's where you would be yes. able to operate out of. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hiltz has helped us kind of, we've already talked to them a bit about starting a school there. Um, but yes, they would be on site at the Wassa School Forest. Okay. And then do you, are you able to share, have you had some interest? Because I see there being a little bit of overlap with some Montessori mm -hmm. type 
um, style. And so do you anticipate this is, these are additional students that those needs aren't being met because they don't have the outdoor emphasis in, in Montessori? Or do you anticipate actually taking students that are currently Montessori students that would maybe transition? <coughs> because there's yeah. a need that for an additional program that has some overlap, not all for sure. Yeah. That's I'm just wondering what where is where are the needs not being met um, through what we already provide that are different. I guess is yeah. So I think it's um, I guess I don't think of it as needs not being met. I think of it as as broadening choice. And okay. so I don't foresee it as you know um, the little bit of like needs assessment that I've done, which is very limited hasn't been like, oh, you didn't like the Montessori, so let's do this. Um, it's much more about, and I guess I view them pretty differently as a parent who cares about education, um, that this, this approach is, you know, Montessori is much more about child-led, like child-led learning, right? Um, and this approach is not that, right? This is about, there's a teacher, they're, they're having someone that's walking them through things. The difference is much more about how it's done. So I guess I see it as more a offering another choice versus saying something isn't good enough. Got it. So it's just a totally yeah. I mean, approach. and I think there will be overlap, sure. but I don't see that as a bad thing. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um. Very interesting idea. I, it's the first I I heard of it. I think I think it's intriguing to say the least. Um. One of the questions I have, you, you mentioned the success in Tomorrow River up to 275. How many students would be a minimum requirement to keep it viable? And the reason I ask is we ran into some, um, you know, we used to have an EGL academy here, and when the enrollment started to dip, it just became, we, there wasn't enough critical mass to make it mm -hmm. work. What Do you know what that volume of students would look like? I can speak to it from the perception of just charter schools in the state of Wisconsin and school districts taking on charter schools. I think it's a really good question to ask. As an authorizer of the school, I think that that would be an expectation that you would want to set up with a charter school when it was starting. Um, that quantity of students or how many students <coughs> per teacher is necessary to have a class teacher. I think most districts kind of have an equation. It usually works out like 12 or 15 students is necessary to really support a class teacher in a classroom, but that would be at your district level to determine what that number is. But part of starting a charter school, the responsibility of that board is fiscal responsibility to their authorizer. So that would be something that you as a district would need to review with a charter school annually to make sure that that school was fiscally re responsible. Um, and then put into place measures for that school to either you know meet those expectations and become fiscally responsible or potentially close. And that, that language would be written into the charter contract. Okay. Yeah, does that help answer that yeah. question? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, it's, it's kind of a TBD based on... It is. There's never a guarantee when you're starting something new. Right. But you can look at the track record of other schools like this in Wisconsin and throughout the United States, and they are all flourishing. Outdoor education and this style of education is what people are looking for. So I think that it would really put your district, um, you know, ahead of the game. And in offering students and families that type of option here in this We community. certainly would have a geographical advantage mm -hmm. if that's the closest one down there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and my only other question was you mentioned that it meets all common core standards in the, the, the high uh, percentage of students that go on to college or what have you. So from a common core comparison standpoint, are you able to measure the success of students in this one? against a traditional public school? You sure can. Um, traditionally, in public water schools, grading looks a little bit different, as does assessments. Um, usually, they're standards-based assessments opposed to grades. But as a charter school, again, same thing in your charter contract, you're going to set up what those benchmarks are for students in those different academic areas. The school is going to be required to have at least two academic assessments in-house, a spring and a fall, 
fall and a spring. So that in their own order and maybe even a winter as well. And so, you know, depending on if they use the same assessment tools, you could directly um, assess and see the comparison to a traditional school setting, I guess, as they might use a different um, assessment tool. But either way, you're going to see where those students land in a general, um, you know, grade how they're doing academically and in addition as a charter school they'll need to participate um, in the state standardized tests and so that's going to be another benchmark where you're going okay. to see that comparison but that's all again part of that charter contract so that school board uh, for the charter school is responsible for sharing out those things with you so fiscal responsibility student learning um, but then you know in in essence trade for that um, accountability to you in those areas there's autonomy that that school is then afforded in how they're bringing that pedagogy and implementing the academics for the students within the school. Okay. And I think, it, I mean, just to dovetail on that, you know, the whole spirit of this is like collaborative and trying to create something that's better for everyone. This isn't about, you know, so the, the standard kind of charter school spirit is that in exchange for autonomy, there is increased accountability. So, you know, this is, once again, just at the very nascent stages, so of course we haven't kind of started sussing out those details, right. but those are all, all those details are not only important to you, they're important, very important to me, because at the end of the day, they're going to be the deliverables we have to you as the authorizer. So, like Camille said, it looks different, but in terms of, and of course, like, we're talking about the education of children, like, we don't want them to not be able to meet benchmarks, you know, that would be, one would argue, a failure, right? So um, it's just that it looks different and it gives us the ability to um, explore education in a way that might be more conducive to certain learners. Okay. And who funds the needs assessment process? The, the, so like, well, I mean, that would be funded by the grant or it's just something that's done like by, because we'll have a, I mean, yeah, well, because we'll have like a, I mean, we, prior to the actual, like, des design year, that one year that's $150,000, there'll be a design team that will come together that I've already kind of identified the people, and we'll be working towards like getting, laying the necessary steps that are, that are necessary prior to even the application of the grant, okay. which is, of course, the needs assessment. So said another way, you're not going to be asking the district to fund any of the needs assessment right now? No. Okay. No, but I think Dr. Hiltz talked a little bit about the potential of utilizing district outreach tools. Like the software. Yeah. Or like do a yeah. survey yeah. or something yeah. like that. But no, we're not looking Maybe. for funding. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I've got, um, well, some pros first and then some concerns and questions. Um, I think the fact that we've got proof that's working in another location is great, um, and that we have an outstanding location for it is also great. And when we start talking about maybe drawing some other students in, like, like move that to the top of my list, because that's really important these days, um, or keeping students that maybe are looking for something different. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of great things, um, but also some questions and concerns, which shouldn't be a surprise since this is the first time we've discussed it. Um, so you talked about needing classroom space at School Forest. Is that in the new building that's being built? Is that building a new structure? Uh, tell me more about that. Dr. Hill tonight, Bill Ted. Sure. We don't know yet. Um, that would be something we would uh, review. I mean, you know, there, there's various temporary shelters that might be able to be used, perhaps down the road, depending on what happens with, with uh, enrollment. We could build something. Um, we'd probably start with something a little more temporary. You're not going to move the, the mobile units from west over there, are you? Uh, they not that you're aware of. They'd fall apart on the way there, I think. Right, so. yeah. No, we're not. Okay. Um, so then you probably wouldn't know the answer to this next question either, which is how would it impact the use of the school force by all of our other schools? Because that's basically our most used facility in the whole district because it's used year-round. Uh, well, and Dr. Hill is already, uh, yeah. I can speak a tiny bit just from the experience of the Toronto Community Charter School. So that environmental station has continued to function as an environmental station with visiting school groups every, just about every single day throughout the entire school year. So I think there is 
you know, really great ways to have that be a shared space and kind of identify space where the charter school is and then identify spa space where the rest of the students that are coming from the traditional school setting utilize. But um, I think as Dr. Hiltz has said, the buildings that currently exist would all stay the same and be utilized at, in the same fashion that they're currently being utilized. New buildings, potentially yurts, or one of the things that we did at the Tomorrow Community Charter School is we did a collaborative project with um, a technical college and the high school. They did their building class, built the frame of a building, and then we used fundraise monies to finish the building on site. So, you know, there's definitely potentials with community partners uh, for those building spaces, but it does also lend itself to this idea of the school growing with the students. So you don't have to have all the buildings in place year one. You have to have enough, you know, through four fourth grade and then you can kind of grow and build those buildings with the students as they go. And one other thing um, that I wanted to mention is at the Tomorrow Community Charter School, currently I think 75 to 80 percent of those students are open enrolled. So if you're thinking about how to bring students into your district, having student and family choice is really a great way to attract new families and um, students from out of district to your district. And I can add on to that because actually as part of my like trying to recruit people for the design team or this team that's going to be working, you know, for free behind the scenes as we kind of try to write this grant, is like I have encountered shocking, I mean, I have fam I have a one person right now who I'm like desperate to get on the design team who's literally considering moving out of Wausau because her child was recently accepted at Tomorrow River and they don't want to have to commute so far so they're going to, I mean, so it's like people... Mm -hmm are doing pretty wild things to uh, to to access to our river um, and and that, and that like including my family we had thought about that and it bit it's an hour drive you know and I thought well we might as well just build it if we want it that much but that's just my, that's just me <laughs> so that, that relates to one of my concerns which is we have a lot of elementary schools for our size and we got like 13 schools and we're not that big of a district um, so I cringe a little bit when I hear adding yet another elementary school to our mm -hmm. district. Um, that's softened a bit by thinking about drawing students in. I mean, if you're bringing more students in, it makes a little more sense. But that would be a big concern that I have. Um, another concern that I have is the competition with Montessori. Um, I don't see it as drawing any students currently from Montessori away, but certainly the students and the families that are looking for an alternative right now for their, you know, four, five, six-year-olds are now going to have another option. And so it, 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 it does concern me a bit that we maybe would be drawing some future students away from Montessori. Um, and maybe that's something that you'll be able to learn more through the needs assessment, um, but that would be something that I would, I would be concerned with. Um, and then one final question, which is, um, so the motion, this would be for you, Dr. Hills, the motion is for us to approve exploration of it. Can you expand on what, what you mean by that and why you want an actual motion? Basically, you don't want people to go through the work of it if we have zero interest, essentially? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, as, as outlined a little bit earlier, we would, we would develop a, a short survey, an interest survey, um, focused on our K-3s um, from our, our own families. Uh, and then based on that, we would create a few in-person opportunities for people to come and kind of learn a little bit about the curriculum. What does this learning look like? How do kids learn outside all the time, all year round? Um, and then uh, based on that and through that, if we have that, that um, what looks to be significant interest, then we would start to develop some of the or answers to some of the questions that you're asking tonight. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Thank you for coming today. Um, yes, so um, the growth at Two Rivers, um, you mentioned that it went from 50 students to 275 students. Um, what was the timeline for that? How many years did that happen? Over an eight-year time period. Eight years? Okay. So in year one, there was 50. It's always kind of, you know, people take that like initial leap. Year two, it was over 100. So more than doubled from year one to year two. Oh, okay. Um, so how did that, how did that growth affect, you know, the buildings that you guys are using at Two Rivers? I mean, was that, was that like a, a growing pain? Like, how did you guys pass that? Yeah, definitely <laughs> always fundraising. <laughs> a lot and a lot of fundraising and or, 
you know, it would be the, you know, if it's space in a referendum or whatever your district decided to do to help create those facilities, but, mm -hmm. yeah, there's growing pains in schools now. Okay, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so with the fundraising, was there ever a time when you guys didn't reach the number that you guys wanted to reach? As far as fundraise monies? Correct. Um, well, I think the fundraising committees always have pretty lofty goals. So I would say every year we didn't meet the goals that we wanted to meet, but we always raised a lot of money and were able to accomplish what we wanted to. It was just a committee that was had very high goals and expectations, but there was never a time where there wasn't a building or something didn't get done. I mean, there was that, we always figured out a way to have the space there. So right now on site, they have two years. They have, you know, we brought in mobile classrooms when necessary, you know, now those are returned because we've been able to build other facilities, but there's usually always a way um, with the funds you have to make it work. I think it just takes creative people that have a uh, mission, and when you're really mission-driven in that way, people, people figure out a way to make it happen. Okay. Um, so, is there is there a fee per child? No, for a charter school, it's just like any other public school within your school district. It's it's a tuition free public school program. Um, that being said, often charter schools have their own five hundred one c three nonprofit, and that would be who is primarily doing the fundraising. So you can fundraise to your families, but you know, as a public school, there's going to be families of all sorts of different economic. Um, backgrounds and so some families are going to be able to give more than others. Some families can give time. Some families can give resources. Um, but no, there would be no fee to attend school. I mean, potentially a supply fee or a, you know a, a, a okay. participation fee, whatever, an activity fee. That's what I'm for. But nothing other than that. Oh, okay. Um, and then in the um, presentation here, it says there's 200 acres of woods and water. Um, how many acres is school forest? 32. 160? Where is it? 500. 500. Just shy of 500. I was like, I actually don't know. I just know. My husband went to Wasa West. He's the one who came up with the idea for the school forest. <laughs> um, and then also, is this all year round? Because I'm guessing. Like the students would do best in the summer. <laughs> no. no. Charter schools in the state of Wisconsin, I mean, that's one of the things they have autonomy over is their schedule. Many <coughs> charter schools align with their school district. Okay. Busing, transportation, school breaks if students are in multiple schools within the district. So that would be something that the design team would have the autonomy to figure out, you know, their schedule for the year. Sometimes that is charter schools really form to have that flexibility over schedule if they do want to meet in the summer or do other things like that. I don't think that that is the plan of your yeah, design I, team. No, I haven't. I mean, to be totally frank, I haven't thought like into that level of detail, but um, no, I, I haven't planned. I assume that it would follow the same timeline as and the same kind of schedule as the Wausau School District for numerous reasons. And um, I, it, I, I sense that it, it sounds like crazy to have kids outside all year, but I, truly my kids have just finished a year. Like, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Like kids just do it, and they kind of, and and you spend more time indoors in the winter, of course, um, but it, it's not a big deal to kids. Well, it, I was just wondering because, like you know, summer they're outside. Oh yeah, it's easier. A whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> no so question. It was just a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just and then one last question: um, the instructors, do they need any special training in order to? Yeah, and that's one of the great things with that charter school grant is that it's really a lot of those funds, the DPI hope, are earmarked for professional development. So there's specific Waldorf teacher training, um, and so there's different ways to participate in that training, but there's training programs throughout the United States, or virtual programs that the teachers would be able to participate in to get that certification. But grant funds can be used for that professional development, that additional training. But the teachers would all need to come in certified in the subject area that they were teaching, so they would need an elementary certification um, to teach at the school. Would it need, I'm sorry, would it need to be K-8, though? It would or need to be K-8, K or they can get a charter school license if they're, you know, K-6 or something like so that's that. that's more? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
Hi, thank you for the presentation. I really did enjoy it. I have a almost five-year-old son, and I can't get him to come in when it's snowing <laughs> without playing. And this is something that I personally would be interested in for my own child. Um, so. I think it's a great idea, but one of my concerns is the amount of elementary schools we already do have, and I think that we need to have the conversation, and this is more for the school board, of condensing the school, or at least starting that conversation before we open up another school. Now, I think this is a great choice for parents and their children that want outdoor learning, because I did go to most of the elementary schools here and just to see how learning has changed from when I was a child where they're on a screen uh -huh. constantly and they're not using their hands, they're not writing, they're not using these motor <coughs> skills that are being lost now. Um, this is something that I would be interested in, but I, my, one of my concerns is the amount of elementary schools we already have and the staffing. We already do have issues with staffing and being able to bring staffing for this school is one of the concerns that I I thought of when you guys were going through the presentation, but I do think this is a great idea <coughs> because I know the Montessori program here is very popular and they have waiting lists, um, but also I would be concerned with the, um, the competition with the Montessori. Would it be something that would work, they work, this program would work together with the Montessori or would it be two different programs? Two different programs, but of course, I'm sure there'd be areas for partnerships, mm -hmm. just as you know, in, in any positive relationship. Yeah, but definitely two different programs. And can I speak just a little yeah. to your concern? So, how many elementary schools do you have? 13. 13. So, say you know, a class size is going to be 20, you would only be pulling one to two students from each one of those schools. Yeah, so I mean, it's if you look at it that way, it's really not a significant student in on any of the schools, knowing that you know, it's just one class. Yeah, it, it's just even before this conversation came up, that was one of my concerns when I was running for school board with the amount of elementary schools we have for the um, the, the size of, of, of our district. Well, and it's definitely some districts do that. They do conversions of a school to a charter school, and then those families in that school would decide do they want to be mm -hmm. in a charter school instead, or they would choose to put their students in one of the other traditional schools. Yeah. So, I mean, I think these are all really great questions. Mm -hmm. And as a district, these are the questions you should be asking. Mm -hmm. I mean, you as a district want to be fiscally responsible and also offer your students options within your district. So what does that look like? Mm -hmm. How can you make it work best for your school district? And yeah, so these are exactly the questions you should be asking. Now, as far as staffing, has there been uh, teachers or paras that have shown interest in the school if it were to come I've actually seen a lot of that like I would say 50% of the responses I got were like can I work there mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so I think that probably I I don't this is this is conjecture on my part but I get the impression that the idea of the school and the way it's taught is um, for a lot of teachers appealing and so I just I've certainly had people be like I don't like my job. No. Like, yeah. can I come work there? But as a charter school, that would be part of your charter contract, yeah. what the hiring process looked like. Uh -huh. DPI is very particular. A district cannot assign teachers to a charter school. So there would have to be an application process, even if it was a teacher within your district already. They would need to go through an application process to teach at that school. Okay. I, I think it's a great program, but like I said, I think we do need to talk about condensing our elementary schools. We have too many elementary schools. I mean, we're open to talking about that. Like, oh, yeah. it's, it's an awesome, yeah. honestly an issue I was completely unaware of until tonight. Yeah, no, so, that, um, yeah, I think, and I guess like what you talked about with technology, that was a big part of the mm -hmm. impetus for me yeah. um, to try to do this. As like these types of schools, their parents are encouraged to limit time interfacing with technology for young children. The school itself very much um, builds an environment where interaction with technology is limited mm -hmm. because we all know that that's going to come any you know they're not the issue of managing technology and, and interacting with technology isn't going to be a problem for any child i think at this point well thank you for bringing this to us because i think it's a great option for our kids thank you yeah.
one note on a timeline. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Camille. This February is the due date for the last round of charter school grants for some number of years, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to do this, um, we would have to apply for the grant this winter, and then you have a one-year planning timeline. So just as an FYI. So grant applications are due February. You usually find out if you got the grant in June. You can start spending those funds in July, and that's your 150000 that you can spend during the planning year. And then, so that would be the 23, 24. The school would open for the 24-25 school year. Okay. Mr. Webster. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a great supporter of charter schools. I uh, have a number of grandchildren who have gone to charter schools within the state. And one graduated with honors last Friday night. Uh, so uh, I'm impressed with what can be done with the kinds of things that you're proposing. Uh, I'm also very impressed with the hands-on learning aspect of what you're talking about. I think about uh, the kids that we have raised out in the country and what happens when you're out there watching, th <coughs> watching things, chasing frogs in the pond and doing those sorts of things. I, am, I, am, uh, I just am a great supporter of uh, a lot of what you're talking about. Um, one concern that I heard, a question that I had though, was um, this was in Tomorrow River, that must be in the Amherst That's uh, correct. Uh, and I'm just curious as to what kind of response the board in Amherst had in regard to a uh, pro project that you've had now, that you've had for a number of years, and what kind of impact they're talking about. Oh, sure, so you mean in rela their relationship with the school? Yes, we, oh, yes. Yeah, so they had an incredibly positive relationship from the start. You know, I think one of their big concerns was similar to yours. Is it going to draw students out of the existing school? Are they going to lose staff there? They didn't lose any. Um, and then the other concern was, is it going to end up costing the district money? And it hasn't. It's just brought really additional revenues into the district with that quantity of open home students. So they have, they have uh, an incredibly good relationship with their school district. And I think that would be the goal of this school too, is you know having a strong car charter contract, but also having things put into place so that um, you're regularly informed about what's happening at the charter school, and the charter school is informing you of the information you need to know that it's operating appropriately as an authorizer. The other question I had had to do with it, literally with the charter schools in um, uh, the kids that are graduating and are coming out of your program, are they going back into the Amherst School District or are they going into charter schools within the Amherst District or throughout the, throughout the state? Uh, so are they going to the traditional classroom after having had the experience or are they uh, opting to stay with some other kind of education? That's a great question. So down in the Amherst area, that is, is a small school district of just over a thousand students and that's the only charter school in the district. So there's no high school options currently. As I mentioned, I'm working with a design team to open a high school in that area so that would give them another option. But that school represents, I think, 16 different school districts. So a lot of those students go back to their home school district and their home high school. Um, so, or they choose Amherst. So Amherst definitely has retained some of those students that are open enrolled at their high school. <coughs> Thank you. Can I ask one more question? After hearing that there, those students are coming from 16 different districts, and it sounds like you would anticipate probably students coming from all over. I've seen. I mean, yeah. I think. I think you would end up pulling people from right. Bozeny and Everest. And yeah. So what does that look like then for transportation? Are families responsible? They are. As a charter school, <coughs> families are responsible for transportation unless they live within the school district. Okay. And then the school district gets to determine if they're responsible for that transportation. And usually a school district takes up that responsibility because yeah. you want to help get your district students to their school. But what some districts have done, um, like what we have done at Tomorrow River, is we've set up pickup spots at the border of the district. So like, you know, we'll pack up, they, the parents drive their kids to a pickup spot at the border, and then the Tomorrow River school bus picks them up, brings them to the traditional school, and then another bus brings them out to the charter school. That makes sense. Okay, great, thank you. Well, I don't have any more questions except pedagogically, I'll get that sooner or later, I, I like all the different things that you're doing. Um, charter schools can offer some different uh, varieties of teaching. Uh, differentiation takes place. 
I like the idea of the environment. Um, so I'm, I'm a believer in charter schools, Lee, as well. I believe that choice is a big thing, and families having that choice, and I do know that charter schools do draw from other places. Not that we're in competition, but we are. <laughs> the line is, is that if we can do uh, a little bit better so that we are enticing others, that'd be great. So with that, we don't have any more questions. And I guess at this point in time, I would like to uh, move to a motion to approve the, the exploration of creating a new charter school in the district. Now, this is as uh, stated earlier by Lance, it is to explore this possibility and have the administration take a look at uh, the needs and all of that. So, For that timeline, can I say one more thing? So that the district would need to determine that yes, you want to have a charter school and that would need to be in writing prior to that grant being submitted. So I mean that's a ways down the road, but no another item would come uh -huh. to the agenda prior to that grant being submitted of a formal Yes, we want to have this charter school. You are the expert in getting the step by step. Yes, yeah, that's why that's why she's with me. Well, and just so, yeah. So I mean, at any point, the Wisconsin Resource Center for Charter Schools through season nine is here to support your district, wanting and as an authorizer, you to have all the information that you need to make an informed decision about starting a charter school within your district. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'm seeking a motion to continue exploration. I would welcome the opportunity to make that motion. I'll second. second. Okay. Any any further questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Agenda item number five: the Montessori Charter Expansion. As we think about expanding here. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to turn it over to you. you. Good evening, everyone. Good to see May, you. May I just add a couple of things here, though, before I turn it completely over to ask? You know, with the passing of the referendum and the expansion of the Montessori Charter Educational Space at Horace Mann, I do want to mention all of that, uh, middle school over time, there is an interest in expand service to students in grades 4K to 8th grade as space allows, beginning with expansion of 7th grade with second or two current 6th grade students in the 22-23 school year. The Montessori charter contract will be amended to include the potential to expand to grades 4K through 8th grade as space allows once the board approves the motion. I need to get that in there. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Now I'll turn it over to you. Great. Welcome, and thank you for having us. I'm joined with Elizabeth Channel, who is the head of school at the Montessori area, um, Wassa area, Montessori Charter School. Mm -hmm. That's a mouthful. Um, got to make sure we get that area in there, right, Elizabeth? Um, so we have some, an exciting opportunity um, at Wassa area, Montessori School, in that with the referendum, passing. Um, there is a space allowance for us to expand our delivery of instructional services, which we're really excited about. Um, and some of that needs to wait until some of that space occurs for us, but we would have an opportunity next year with two sixth grade students who would be moving into seventh grade to be able to uh, instruct those students without any space expansion. So we're looking for that opportunity to do so. And in the process, we would be amending our current charter contract um, to include the 4K through 8th grade expansion as space allows. Um, and we don't need to renew a contract to do that. It's just a, an amendment to that current contract. Um, the Governance Council has already uh, approved of that last week. Um, the, move, the expansion to 4K through 8th grade, as well as um, in, in the next school year, um, inviting those two 6th grade students to stay with us in 7th grade. So that piece has already been um, approved and with excitement. Uh, through the through the governance council last week. Do you have anything to add, Elizabeth? No, we are just very happy that um, the public passed the referendum. We're very grateful for that and looking forward to all of the opportunities that we have for the future. And you run a tight ship over there. I, I just want to say <laughs> and that. And I get to be the Hewitt Texas principal, so it's really exciting. <laughs> well done. 
So with that, um, I'm seeking a motion to expand the education and delivery of services in the Wausau Montessori Charter School to grade 7 in the 2022-23 school year and to grades K, uh, 4K through 8th grade as the referendum expansion of space allows. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Okay. Agenda item number six, uh, insurance and sale of general obligation bonds for referendum projects. Uh, administration suggests a motion to recommend that the board approve issuance and sale of $99,990,000 general obligation school building and improvement bonds as a result of the referendum vote on April 7th. Administration would then work with our financial advisor and bond counsel to prepare the appropriate offering documents, conduct the Moody's rating call in association with the issuer, and conduct the competitive sale. Pending committee approval, uh, the competitive bond sale will be conducted on June 13th, and all final documents will be presented at the board meeting on that date. The balance of the full $119,800,000 referendum approved debt issue will be conducted at a later date as market conditions warrant. So with that, Mr. Thank Jackson. you. I want to start by introducing a guest that I have along with me tonight. Eric Cass is uh, Director of Public Finance from PMA, and I'm going to give him a chance to talk in a little while about the strategy that we've been discussing for quite some time, actually. Uh, continued that discussion after April 7th and the passage of the referendum. But I also want to go back a little bit further. Uh, I think it's relevant uh, to talk about what happened on January 17th. On January 17th, the board took action to go to referendum. And you might recall on that evening, we reduced the bond amount significantly. And we also talked about if we could reduce the bond amount to $120 million, or right around $120 million, maybe put off some of the elementary work that we were considering, we could do it with a reduced mill rate. Our mill rate would go down, what we said was 43 cents. We're going to achieve that. Eric's going to talk about that in a little while. And also on January 17th, you talked about making sure we build in an opportunity for an eventual referendum to address some of the elementary school issues that we're going to talk about quite a bit in the next several months. So the strategy includes mill rate management, offering that secondary opportunity and achieving that mill rate reduction that we told the community we were going to do. So as you mentioned a second ago, Mr. Boucher, the actual sale will happen on June 13th if we get approval tonight. So if we get approval tonight, we start continuing our work on developing the offering documents and we're having a Moody's call tomorrow morning, as a matter of fact. We continue to work with our financial advisor, PMA, our bond counsel, Quarles and Brady. We develop all the offering documents for June 13th. And on June 13th, during the day, we conduct a competitive sale. And for finance, people like Eric and myself, that's an exciting day. It's like watching an online auction buying $100 million worth of bonds. And uh, we get enjoyment in, in watching that. Don't we? <laughs> so... Uh, and things will go well during the day, and we'll develop the actual documents. We'll bring them to you June 13th at night, and then you will approve that bond sale to whoever competitively gets the award. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric for a little while, and Eric's going to talk a little bit about that strategy that we've developed over the last several months. Thank you, and good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talking about kind of the planning. As, as Bob talked about, there's a lot of strategy that goes into it, but all good strategies are malleable and they change over time. So one of the things I'm going to start with are, is the interest rate environment, and that's driving a lot of the strategy behind what we're looking at here today. But before we get into this, into this um, what you see up on the screen right there are, I think, three major variables that we really focused on as kind of guiding principles, so to speak, if we put together this current plan. The number one is to minimize interest rate risk. And so you're going to see a flavor of that and why that's so important in this rising interest rate environment in tandem with inflation. Provide flexibility for tax levy and mill rate management moving forward. That's something that Bob just alluded to. It's, it's kind of been a strategy that the board 
and the administration has used over the past few years, so we didn't want to lose sight of that as it relates to that flexibility that you've had over the past few years. And then, of course, meeting construction spending timelines. We want to make sure that the plan gives you the money in the bank, so to speak, to make sure that the projects can get paid for as they continue throughout their development and ultimate integration here at the district. So the exciting part, I'm just kidding, the interest rate environment. The most important thing you can take out of this graph is the far right. And I'm going to expand that in a second to give it a little bit more color. But you see a st steep increase. What you're looking at here is a 20-year history on an apples to apples market comparison. It's called the AAA MMD index. This is not the interest rate you're going to receive as a school district. That's something completely different. It's simply a trend analysis that we have access to. What that solid line is, is when we pulled this chart last week to make sure it was available for your board docs, that was the 3.19%. And that's a visual, because you can see over the last 20 years, we've been above, we've been below. Very recently, there's a lot of below. The last two years driven by the pandemic. Ultimately, one of the lowest points in the last 20 years, all the way back to 1994, you can see in the green box of 1.08% happened in August of 2020. If we go back and issue these bonds in August 2020, we would, but of course we can't. We have to deal with the current interest rate environment we're, we're seeing. And you can see that current level right now is at 3.19%. That's volatile and it moves on a daily basis. But as I talked about, what you can see here is looking at from the start of the year to where this ended, then in May 2nd of 2022, you see significant increases in three different indices that we track. The bottom line is if you're going to do a five-year borrow, the middle line is a 10-year borrow, and the top line is what we're talking about here this evening, which is the 20-year borrow. Two things are, uh, I want to draw your attention to here as it relates to interest rates. Starting at the beginning of the year, very low. Starting where we're at right now, pretty significant increases, right? That was that steep increase that I showed you on the, on the chart. Just kind of expanded that for you to see it a little bit more visually. One thing I'm going to come back to on this chart is some of the strategies that we'll explore with future borrowings because this evening we want to focus our attention on what you're going to be asked to approve and, and do on the 13th. We don't want to lose sight of some of the underlying strategies that we're continually to monitor. And so we're going to look at, uh, in the future, some different short-term borrowing opportunities that would allow the board the ability to pay off debt faster, save long-term interest, and ultimately save the, the taxpayers um, more money as we go through this process. That's really small, which I apologize up on your screen. Uh, but what you're looking at here is the current financing plan for the school district. Over on the left is what you currently have, debt outstanding. And what we're talking about now is the 99.99 million, and that's that first column as we get inside the box. So inside the box is all the new referendum dollars as we sit here today. Those are piggybacked by two future issues that we're not considering now, but potentially in 2023 and 2024, a little bit less than $10 million. That was done on purpose because that's something called bank qualified. So as a tax exempt entity, the lowest rate structure from an interest rate in the market is normally going to be tax exempt. Taxable has to have a premium on top of it because the investor has to pay taxes. Well, every issuer, including a school district, gets a 10 million block of issuance called bank qualified that can even be lower than tax exempt. It's about a quarter of a percent right now in the marketplace. <coughs> And the reason is, is that banks are incentivized to work directly with school districts to buy those blocks of debt and get further tax credits beyond just the tax exempt status that an investor would receive, therefore giving you the lowest rate possible in the marketplace. So the reason why those are below the 9.9, we strategically did that as a future avenue to hedge against any future interest rate risk. Because issuing the 99.9, .9, which we'll see in a minute, is issuing about 83% of the total outstanding debt, which again, in a rising interest rate environment that I showed you in a, a couple of earlier slides, is extremely important to lock in that 20-year that debt. Remember, we saw that steep increase over the last three months. It's kind of hard to see, but also inside the box, we're applying some cash on hand. So every November when you set your tax levy, you're ma managing your mill rate a little bit, and one of the strategy, strategies you've used over the past few years is to use that additional debt to pay off your current debt a lot more quickly than you maybe would have otherwise, saving extreme amounts of long-term interest. For example, if we did a seasons <coughs> with this amount, it would save about $3 million. Well, what we found is using it to apply a larger principle, which you'll see under the 99.9 .9 in the first year, saves way more than $3 million because we're able to take 20-year debt and pay it off basically today. 
shorten the amortization, therefore saving a lot more long-term interest exposure on higher interest debt than what you currently have on the books. That's an important piece of this because we want to make sure that we're clear that that's how we're applying that, that dollar amount and that amount of money. Getting outside the box, I think what I'm going to do is get to the next slide, which is a little bit easier to read. Because part of this is, of course, delivering on at least the tax promise uh, prior to the referendum, which is a reduction of 43 cents. So this current plan is laid out today with the 99.9 .9 million being issued in June with estimates on what those rates are and then increasing those rates over the next couple of years, leaning on some of those bank qualified status and things like that, we're projecting that the tax impact would be a drop of 44 cents here today. Now just to be clear, we also know that we still have another 20-ish million or 18 million to issue, so we can't promise that those interest rates are going to be, but when we look at trends, we feel very comfortable that this will not be an, an issue to meet that obligation. One last thing I want to highlight that Bob talked about is we're continuing, as, as you look beyond the two lines, we're continuing to build in a natural drop in the levy to have future considerations for any other capital improvements that the school district may have, whether it's elementary related or other, other things that the administration will bring to the board's consideration. That was an important component that Bob wanted us to make sure we continue to maintain for the school board. Finally, just to kind of wrap it up before I uh, turn it over to you all for any questions, is that again, this would lock up about 83% of your long-term debt, which is, in our minds, a very responsible thing to do. It allows the school district to manage the um, capital projects and the cash needed to do that. Um, but when we look at some strategies we're going to monitor over the next few years, we're going to look at um, the 20-year bank qualified issue in 2023 and 2024, which I talked about. So this isn't the last time we're going to be here talking about interest rates and issuing debt. We're going to look at issuing shorter term notes with faster prepayment. So again, when we looked at that second chart that had spreads between 2010 and 5, there's interest rate savings in there. So depending upon what your levy looks like over the next few years, there might be an opportunity to issue maybe 5 or 10 year debt, locking in lower interest rates and paying that off faster than maybe that 20 year issue on that bank qualified would be. And then finally, we'll look at issue the remaining amount in 2023. If we continue to see interest rate hikes as the Fed looks to raise rates to stave off inflation, at least the portion that they can control, um, we may be coming back to you in early 2023 with a recommendation to issue all of it because we continue to see interest rate exposure as your biggest risk factor at that point in time. But that'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions to begin with? Um, let's move quickly from the other side. Uh, Lee, what's your... I have no questions. I do. That's good. No. There are no questions. With that, I believe I can go to motion. That means you did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Either Vaso looks so brilliant or... <laughs> we'll finish that quote. Um, I, sorry, a little chuckle on my side. <laughs> I'll appreciate the joke. Uh, I'm seeking a motion to recommend to the board a resolution awarding the sale of a $99,990,000 general obligation school building and improvement bonds, series 2022A. So moved. <clears throat> Second. Any more questions or any questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Tess, I think you can just continue. I'll just the committee will have an opportunity to review the referendum design and construction timeline and consider its approval as presented. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I've got another guest with me here tonight I'm going to introduce. This is Russ Schumacher. He's the lead of the design team from Nexus's perspective and all the professional services. So he's going to get a chance to share some of these slides with me. But I'll start, and then I'll turn it over to Russ in a little while. Uh, when we passed the uh, resolution at the board meeting on January 17th, we said, now the real work started. We engaged the community. And once we engaged the, engage the community and turned it over to them on April 7th, the community voted in favor of exactly what we asked them to vote on January 17th. And I've gotten uh, a lot of questions about what do we do now? And I, I find myself saying, now the real work starts. 
and now the real fun starts, and now it's going to start looking real. And all of those things are happening right now, and we've been uh, pretty engaged in that process already. Uh, we're designing some of our spaces uh, in Group 1. So tonight, we want to ask your approval. Uh, it may seem redundant, but what you gave approval for on January 17th for us to ask the community of, and the community gave approval for on April 7th, we're coming to you again tonight, and again June 13th, for you to approve the projects and approve the general timeline. And there are actually two agenda items tonight. We want to approve how we award bids for bidding out everything uh, in construction of the project. So with the next slide, thank you, Cassie, we're going to give Russ a chance to introduce the project team, some of which are with us tonight. We're going to talk about project timelines. And when we talk about the project timelines, I'm going to pause to offer the board a chance to consider uh, taking some action on a motion that we've crafted. We're going to talk about the design process and how it develops over time with 19 different buildings that we're working on. There's going to be a lot of overlap and it's going to be a continuous, uh, every step in the design process we're almost going to be at for any given building and they'll overlap and we'll keep uh, accumulating and we'll talk about it every single month at the board meeting or at the board, uh, during the board meeting. We're going to talk about next steps and offer another motion, and then, of course, we'll offer opportunities to ask questions. Russ, how about if I turn over to you for, uh, for this slide? Perfect. Thank you, Bob. Um, thank you for giving us some time tonight to share where we're at right now and where we're going. The Nexus team has been very busy since April 6th, uh, and you'll be seeing a lot of us over the next few years. Um, a few of my cohorts are here tonight. Brent Jones, my business partner, was very involved in developing the overall plan initially. Uh, uh, the projects, um, as we started with, to, to issue for referendum and also oversees the construction for Nexus. He's behind me, Brent Jones. Also with me is uh, Sharon Gould. She's one of our senior program managers. And what she does is shepherd the design process to make sure that we stay within the confines of the scopes that were supported by the referendum and also uh, within the budget as well so that we are um, good stewards of the taxpayer dollar and also Nick Anderson is with me he's one of our project managers that will be on site and he has been actually doing projects within uh, the Wausau district for the past seven years in addition to the people we have tonight um, Sharon uh, as I said will shepherd the design process um, she'll have people supporting him such as Steve Schoner who helped with the early on stages of the planning um, and Brian Witcherly um, in the office uh, we have a, a Chuck Miaska, who leads our design. Uh, he has people supporting him, Andrew Denman, Ben King, Ryan Marks, that'll help in the design process. They'll be involved in the day-to-day -day coordination as Sharon oversees the entire process. And then once the projects are bid and ready to be built, um, Nick Anderson will lead that process with support from Todd Richter, uh, some site superintendents, Scott Karnowski, Eric Radke, additional ones as needed as more projects ramp up and Jane Balch and Mark Nichols, who will be project coordinators. So in addition to the people you see on our current um, uh, org chart up there, we have a lot of people in, in the office helping to support us from energy engineers, contract specialists, um, commissioning agents, and that to help make sure the projects are delivered on time and on budget. Not to mention we've also engaged over 20 sub-consultants that are currently working on the project as we speak. So we're off to a, a good start, and we'll share some of those particulars in just a little bit. Thank you. Next, I want to talk about the first action that we would like you to consider tonight. It's the project timeline and the approval of such. You already approved the project budget, essentially, on January 17th, and the community also approved the project budget on April 7th. What you see up here, again, written pretty small, but the names of the, the schools are, are, are pretty large over on the left. And if you follow the color code, the dark blue, is the design phase for any one of those buildings. And then you go into the bidding phase where we have all the bid level documents created and we put it out for bid. And there's an open window where uh, the bidders ask us questions and they submit their bids and we open the bids and we're gonna talk about that later on tonight in the next agenda item. And then the construction phase obviously is the longest. Uh, and it's really long for buildings such as John Muir and Wausau West, which we know have significant work uh, and the construction phase lasts pretty long, and then, of course, you finish your punch list and you move into the building. So for each one of those, that's where we're at right now. It may change, obviously, 
the work that you're engaged in with the two different committees that we're doing at the end of the summer and into the fall could change some of that. Obviously, when things get a little bit off track, it could change sub subsequent jobs. So this is our project timeline, including the bidding and the construction and the ending of the project and the punch list that we would ask you to approve. This would be the motion. Uh, approve the referendum design, bidding, and construction timeline as presented, and with that, we'll entertain any questions you might have. So let's move this forward. Uh, let's, uh, we're seeking an approval, or let's see here. I'm seeking an approval, the referendum design, bidding, and construction timeline as presented. So moved. Second. Now, questions? I've got one on the elementary school, so that work is the safety and security. Um, obviously for that, philosophically, the sooner the better. So why are we waiting? The thought there was, um, as you guys are discussing the utilization of those schools, um, a lot of those scope items, like you say, of security, uh, safety and security, are all consistent with them and are fairly quick to put together. So as you're having those discussions on long-term utilization, we can move those up. We just wanted to put those out there now to allow you time to, to figure out long-term plans. Okay, because there's some on here, I'm guessing we could collectively say these are going to be not impacted by any discussion. Right, and that's the ones you see up front right now. Um, some of these also, for instance, like Hawthorne Hills has that road that we have to put in. So that's something we wanted to get started, or at least the work with the city. I know you've had some municipal right. meetings already. Um, so, yeah, really, this is this is creating space for us to have that conversation about the structure of the elementary school. Okay. Also, the school forest, we had a little bit of design work done already with the school forest. Uh, Statine, Riverview, and South Mountain all include classroom additions uh, that we wanted to get going on as quickly as possible. And John Muir, because of the size of the project, we wanted to get going on that one. It's shown up here in group two, but we're working on our design elements of that building also right now. And then Dr. Hiltz already mentioned uh, Hawthorne Hills. Not a lot of work done in the building itself. But we would do that simultaneously with at least planning for the road in the back. A lot of things have to be done with the city and some site work. And we'd love to do all of them at once, but we just we can't tackle all of them at once. So that's how we kind of prioritize which ones we're going to go first. We just open questions here. Any others? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you. There are two motions wrapped into one presentation, but the next motion talks a little bit about how we bring uh, the bids to you and how we approve bids and how you see updates on the progress that we're making. So I'm going to turn it over to Russ for a little while to talk about the design process itself. Perfect. We created a little uh, pyramid there to hopefully visually describe our design process, which is very collaborative and it's very inclusive. Um, it's your project. We treat it like our own, but it's your project. We want to make sure your staff, your educators all have their imprint on the project as we move forward. Um, starting with you know the tip of the spear with, with you all sitting here at the school board, um, we'll talk about the way we want to keep you updated, how we propose to do that in working with administration, um, have you approved the projects before they do go out for bid so that you can see that all of the measures met the intent of the referendum and um, we will have an active budgeting process along there to make sure that we keep things within budget and on time. And then from there, we have a district leadership team that's been created, and their role is really to set up standards, um, set up, uh, create uh, the, the vision, um, continue to make sure that we have equity across all of the projects that we're doing, also meeting with specialty groups like special education and, and technology and a lot of the things that we want to include in all of the projects and make sure that they're all being equally, um, equally attentive to those needs. Um, from there, we go to each individual building, and we'll have a building design committee that'll consist of the principal, maintenance folks, and other key stakeholders, um, some educators from different areas of the building, different curriculums, so that they all get input into what the initial concept was, and then actually making that into a design building that can be bid and then ultimately built. 
And then from there, we also have um, kind of the devil in the details in each of the space, meeting with individual user groups, be it, be it athletics, be it special ed, be it the science folks, be it food service, be it theater, so that all of those specialty areas get the attention and thoughts from, from the team necessary to make it a complete design that everybody at the end can say, yes, collaboratively, this is, this is, what, we, this is what we want. So it's very much collaborative. It's very much um, a consistent um, cadence of meetings. Sharon schedules all of those. In fact, for, uh, for, for group one, all of them are currently scheduled. We've already had some that we'll show you here in a second, uh, and they'll continue through the summer until we issue projects for a bit in the fall. The district leadership team uh, consists of Dr. Keith Hiltz, Bob Tess, Larry Sealer, um, Cassie Peck, John, John Uding, and Diana White. And they're um, the tip of the spear of, of making some of those decisions when um, we're meeting with some of the teams and some of the user groups, and there might be two equally supported ideas. 50% of the folks would like to see this happen, the other 50 would like to see this. We would present some options to this team and they would help direct the design teams to make sure that we're getting consistent direction from your administration. Going back to those project timelines, um, again those are the group one that you see up there. Um, we have had quite a few meetings already. As you can see we've had uh, uh, five leadership team meetings. Some of those did include already technology and special education. Also things we're discussing like what type of security um, type of process do you want that comes through the door? Do you want uh, the, the person at the front desk to buzz them in? Do you want them to buzz in two doors, one door? What can we do consistently for safety and security in each of these buildings that's implemented consistently in each of the buildings? Um, Statine, we've already had two building design committees meetings as well as user group meetings. Riverview, the same thing. Hawthorne Hills, School Forest, South Mountain, and um, as was mentioned, John Muir, even though it's part of Group 2, we know that there's a lot of programming and a lot of discussions that have to take place because it's very, very complex. So we've started those meetings already. Additionally, Sharon's already set up meetings with Rib Mountain um, to talk through process and permitting, as well as WASA. Uh, we've had two meetings there for permitting processes as well as kind of a collaborative approach to that road at Hawthorne Hills. So um, we are um, well into this and uh, we're running hard and we'll continue this. <coughs> so Can next I ask one question yes, on, that, on that piece. Regarding the, the design teams, um, again, going back to safety and security, I assume that you bring in some type of external consultants who do safety and security of school buildings all day? Correct. Is that the case? And nothing against the people that you mentioned are involved, but you guys don't know, we don't know what is the latest and greatest in terms of safety and security issues. Right. So so what we typically do there is, you know, I haven't been uh, involved in schools for over 20 years, <coughs> we'll show options of where it's progressed and what some other similar districts have utilized, and then a lot of times we'll bring in the police department and have them take a look at it as well. Okay, because there's, I mean, there's consultants out there where this is all they eat, sleep, and breathe is absolutely security assessments yeah. and recommendations. So, yes. I, I would encourage you to pursue that. I mean, to me, this is a big deal. Obviously, I think it's sure. to everyone. Um, I just want to make sure that we do have the latest and greatest. And again, nothing against police departments, but right. um, there's just, there's interesting things happening in that space. I think that we want to take advantage of. We also take advantage of our insurance company. They have some experts. Uh, Police Department Pupil Services has that connection to the, the National SRO School Resource Officer, uh, obviously architects and designers, and we access a lot of different uh, paths to find out what's best practice. And oddly enough, best practice does change from time to time. Recently we've seen that in the last 10 years how an event will happen and best practice will change. So we try to create something that's more universally accepted or more timeless. Yeah, if I could just add. Um, I agree with you, Pat. You know, there are um, school safety specialists and much of what they do in addition to just hardening the building is protocols uh, and procedures, things like that. So we've worked with a number of folks and a lot of those kinds of things are already in place in our schools. Our schools are really safe. We're really working on hardening the schools right now and at this point. So um, we appreciate that feedback. But I want people to know the schools are safe. We're just making them safer. So the next step, we're going to put
put another motion in front of you to uh, allow you to take action on how you see progress that we make at the board level and how we allow you to vote on that progress to give you a comfort level that you're, you're at the top of that pyramid, as Russ just mentioned a little while ago. You're already at the top of the pyramid by getting to this point, but we're going to keep you at the top of that pyramid. Uh, when our design work gets about 50%, we would like to show you an update. And with 19 different projects going on, or 19 different buildings, that's going to be continuous. You're going to see this cycle of you're seeing updates. It's a 50% update today. When we get to the point where it's 95% design progress update, and we're ready to bid this thing out. We want you to give us, give us the thumbs up on, yes, please bid out this project as we see it right now. We see it at the 95% mark. Uh, it's ready to bid out, very close to being bid out. You give us the thumbs up. We'll finish the design to make true construction documents, or bid documents, rather, and those bid documents will hit uh, the marketplace and we'll bid it out. Uh, that will take six, eight weeks, depending on how many bids and how intense of a project this is. Uh, what we would like to do is we would like to award the bids as an administrative team. And usually it's pretty boring. Oftentimes you see here are the bids. Here's the low bid. We'll accept it. If any abnormalities or any anomalies take place, if it's significantly different from the budget, if we're not accepting the low bidder for some reason, or there are other unusual circumstances, we'd like to come to you first and say, we're not going to take the low bidder or we're not going to take this bidder. There's something strange going on or it's significantly over budget. We would bring those to you. And that's in an effort to stay on time. If, if we had to do this and we had to bring every uh, bid opening to the board and wait for our board approval on the bid opening, it could significantly delay some of these projects. So we would like you to take action on giving us, the administrative team, the authority to award the bids after you tell us exactly what we bid out. And if anything is unusual, we'll bring it back to you. And then, of course, the last one, although it wouldn't be uh, continuous board approval, it would be continuously updating the board. You'll see from us every month. And we'll talk about the two big questions. Is it on time? Is it on budget? Is it on time? Is it on budget? And from 2015, you saw me regularly. I was scheduled at every board meeting for a couple years. And this is probably going to be no different. I'm going to be here at every board meeting for you know, the duration. So you're going to see updates on the, on the projects as we go. So this would be the motion that we would ask you to entertain. <coughs> but of course, we can answer any questions as well. So I just have one question. Do you want to do the motion? Let me get the motion and then okay. we'll ask questions. Seeking a motion to approve the referendum bid approval process as presented. So moved. Second. Questions? So, by approving this, the bid documents that you guys would open and award per these criteria are still public record and can be inspected by anyone requesting it at any time. Through public records request, yes. Sometimes we try to make it a little bit maybe cumbersome to get honest answers from bidders, right? Sometimes bidders put in that this is a trade secret, I don't want you to read this. Usually it sides with the person making the open records request mm -hmm. for open records. It's all fair game. Sure. Okay, just I just want to make sure that people understand that, that this isn't anything that is, we're going with this guy that slides off into the abyss somewhere. Absolutely, and that's mm -hmm. why we're saying also that if it's not the low bidder, we're going to have a public discussion. Sure. Yeah. That helps also. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Okay, recommendation for preliminary 2022-23 budget uh, estimated approximately time. I'm going to give you, I'm going to keep you on time this time. Okay. Uh, the initial version of this year's budget is based on assumptions presented in November and the budget reconciliation plan approved by the board earlier in May and is being presented here. Thank you. Last year, we tried a new format 
with board presentations where we were going to give a face page with a bunch of links that took us elsewhere in the presentation. So this is a holdover from that presentation format that I used last year. So we could get away with just showing the space page. The budget calendar takes you to the budget calendar, and it's a long process, and that's both good and bad. The good is we're digesting this stuff gradually. We looked at the projection model back in November, and then we looked at the assumptions, and then we presented that. We presented a budget reconciliation plan, which feeds this budget. And this budget will need to be passed one way or another before our fiscal year starts on July 1st. So this is our last chance at the committee level to see approval of an initial budget on June 13th also. Uh, the basis of that budget is exactly what I said. It's the projection, then it's the budget reconciliation plan, it's a staffing plan, it's all of those things that feed into a very preliminary budget. That budget will continue to change. June 13th is the next real big example of how it might change. The budget includes Fund 39. Fund 39 is payment of referendum debt. We haven't even issued $100 million of referendum debt. So that will be a big part of the budget. That will be revealed June 13th. Other things get revealed into the fall when you start counting students. You start developing a staffing plan. You get the voucher impact. Equalized value updates. Some of those things don't get revealed till much later in this budget building process. And then the initial budget by fund is what we're required to show you, and then the motion that you would entertain. If I click that last hyperlink, it would take me to this is what you're actually considering in that motion. It's every one of our funds. Fund 10 is the general fund. That might go through the most changes yet. Fund 27 is special ed fund. Fund 38 is non-referendum debt. We're still paying off some energy efficiency debt from about eight years ago. Fund 39 is the referendum debt. You will see for the first year a huge difference between revenue and expense. And the reason why, Eric Cass talked a little while ago about not defeasing debt this year. We have $10.25 million of dollars that we levied last fall that under normal circumstances we would defease debt. You remember that term from other years? In about March we didn't do that this year because we wrapped it into our new borrowing. So it's wrapped right into our new bond issue. So we see it on the revenue side, but we're not going to see quite the same expense size. But those will get updated once the bonds are issued. Fund 50 is food service and Fund 80 is community service. And then on top of the bottom part, you see what our original projections were. And then on the bottom is what happened after you passed the budget reconciliation uh, motion. And that was in April, I believe, you, you passed that. So with this being presented, the motion would be in bold. Okay, with that, seeking a motion to approve the preliminary budgets as presented in order to proceed with 2022-23 expenditures committed to before final budgets are approved. So moved. Second. Any questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Agenda item 10, uh, membership and renewal for 2022-23. Uh, Dr. Rauscher will preview, uh, preview the WIA membership renewal. The documents are expected to be sent to the district the first week in June in time for formal approval at the June regular board meeting. Yes. Hi, everybody. Probably took me longer to walk up here than I will to to speak at this point, but we just did want to preview for you that we'll be talking about the WIA renewal at the next meeting, and as many of you know, our WIA membership is very valuable, not just to the district, but specifically to our student athletes and our coaches. Uh, it offers a lot of really good supports for them. So we'll bring that official paperwork as soon as we get it, and in between there, if you have questions, let Dr. Hiltz know. I'm sure he'll pass that on to me, and we can make sure we have those answered for you next time we're together. Should we hold on questions? And if possible, take a little break here at this point in time.
we may. We've got two members on it already, so if we yeah. just a five minute break. <laughs> I think it would be wise. Do we want to advance yeah. this motion yeah. and then we'll come back in, in June and take final action? That'd be perfect. Okay. Um, I'm seeking a motion to renew the uh, WIA budget for 2022-23. So, so moved. moved. Second. Any questions? Not in, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Take a little break. Take a little break. Get right. some coffee and a couple of cookies in anticipation of the long meeting. Take coffee while we did. It's almost uh, right. <laughs> started the song to take a break. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's like a cold song. I'm glad you were on my left hand Yeah. 